Hey, Stalker. Tired from a long journey, I assume? Why not sit here and rest by the campfire? Kick back for a bit, have something to eat, and share some stories with the guys. You've undoubtedly seen a lot in your wandering. So my parents used to be big outdoor buffs. My father is an ex-champion hobby boat racer, and my mom was an Alabama-raised country girl, so they always wanted to camp and go sailing and fishing and sheet when I was little. They went on a trip with some friends of theirs when I was about 10, Reed as 16 years ago. And since then, they refused to go camping anymore. Ever. My dad told me the story sometime after I had turned 18. It still makes me wonder, considering the following. My parents moved a lot and only had one set of friends they really kept in touch with all the time. Danny and Lisa. Danny and Lisa weren't outdoor nuts like my parents were but they were friends and it's fun to camp with your friends, right? So they all planned a five-day trip to a lake south of where we lived, with a creek that was on Danny's father's property, so they could camp on the property and fish all they wanted, then go to the lake with ease. They all left and everything from now on is from my father's account. He told me this once, and only once, and got drunk after he told me, which is extremely uncharacteristic of him anymore. The first two days were normal, just camping, drinking, sharing stories while fishing and boating and water skiing heaven. It was just young adults' parents having fun. The second night, all night, everyone kept hearing weird yelps and barks, like two dogs were in a fight, but were both just hurt and yelping the whole time. They figured coyotes and slept. The next day, they continued on their adventures. That night, they kept hearing those noises, but they were extremely close to the camp. So my father and Danny went out to go see if they could scare them off, while my mom and Lisa stayed behind scared out of their minds hiding in a tent, probably reading the Bible or something. Anyways, my dad and Danny went out to look for these fighting coyotes searching by following the sound. My dad had a shotgun and Danny a machete. They were hoping to scare the coyotes, or whatever they were with a gunshot. They got to a clearing and could hear the noise extremely loud, but it seemed to be from multiple directions as if the sounds were distant from each other. Now, my dad is a bit of a cook, swears he saw Bigfoot at 14, but this is different. He just told Danny to go back. No questions, no explanation, just, Danny, we need to go back. So they did, but the sounds didn't fade away this time. Danny nervously asked my dad what was going on, but my dad wouldn't tell him. He just kept shooshing him. Danny is a bit of a goofball, hence why I always liked my uncle Danny so he thought my dad was getting him back for a prank. He kept nudging my dad and trying to get him to say, gotcha, but my dad never untensed. Finally, they got close to the creek, a ways up from the camp, and my dad told Danny to run, fast, sprint. Then my dad took off, no remorse. Danny apparently followed, but tripped and called for my dad, but my dad, who tears up and sputters a bit at this part, also uncharacteristic of him, refused to go back for him, even though Danny started calling for help. Danny was yelling that his leg was broken, it hurt, etc., but my dad just kept running. Then, my dad, my mom, and Lisa all say they heard what sounded like a really, really, really ducking loud cougar growl. Imagine two lionesses going at it, amplified by 70 Marshall full stacks. That's how loud they said it was. It made my dad's ears ring. After that, Danny stopped screaming for help. My dad got back to camp and the ladies asked what the duck was going on. But my dad just said something was out there. My mom, being the practical woman she is, says well no, sheet, what was it? My dad wouldn't answer. Lisa is freaking out asking where Danny is, but my dad just keeps saying he'll be here in a second. A few hours pass by and the ladies are extremely worried about Danny, while my dad apparently would cringe when they said something. Finally, from the opposite side my dad arrived from, came Danny, walking just fine up to the camp, wordlessly. My dad cocked his rifle but waved it away as survival readiness, something my mom says she won't forget, because that's what tipped her off that something was wrong. Danny first walked up and nudges his way next to my mother, but after the weird looks and the death glare from my father, moved closer to Lisa who had been nagging him for about 10 minutes, but he would either grunt yes or no, or would just stare into the fire. My dad finally asked Danny what happened to his leg, and Danny looked up confused almost. My dad told him, I thought you said it was broken. Danny looked at him and replied, 
broken. Then, as if on cue, I started yelling, Steve, ow my leg, I think it's broken. I noped writing that part. I can just imagine it all too ducking well. The ladies grabbed medkits and first aid and water and were rationalizing it as him going into shock. But upon getting his pants off, with much difficulty as he refused to help them, and actually would make harder for them to remove them, there was no obvious break, no blood, just bruises all up and down his side. Lisa kept asking him what happened, but he would grunt and wave her hands away from the bruises. My dad said, He's fine, let's just sleep. My mom gave him the are you ducking kidding me look, and he gave her the do it woman look. That's right, old school and still working as duck. And so she complied as he never does that, and they went to their tent. They say they heard Lisa nagging and one-sided arguing with Danny because he would never reply when she would ask him questions, which I just think is a genius wife enraging tactic. And so she finally yelled, she's going to pee. Danny asked if he could come with her since there were animals out there, in not so many words. She said okay, and they left. My dad woke up about 10-ish in the morning and started making breakfast. Danny and Lisa were gone. My mom asked where they were, but my dad wouldn't reply. After a little while, they both came back, rather unceremoniously and without a word. They weren't holding hands or in each other's arms or arm over the shoulder or anything like they always were, just kind of awkwardly standing next to each other. They refused food and Danny would randomly yell out, my leg, and Lisa kept complaining of feeling ill. My mom suggested they go home and call off the trip on account of Danny's leg, who had not been limping at all, to my mom's horrified recollection and the two nodded. My father just kinda watched. They all agreed, so Danny and Lisa got in my parents' car, not theirs, and just waited. Didn't pack up their tents, food, coolers, bags, anything. My mom came over and asked if they were going to grab their things and they shook their heads. My dad asked, Why don't you take your car? And they both said, broken, just like Danny had last night, in a creepy, practiced way. My dad sighed and packed up the car and they drove off. Danny and Lisa stayed quiet the whole way, there except for random mumblings to each other, completely indecipherable. My parents took them home and came and got me, and we could all tell something was wrong, besides coming back days early. They said Danny got hurt so they came home. This part on is from me now, after they all got home. I asked if we could go see them but my dad replied, No a little too quickly and so I thought he was mad at me so I left to go play PlayStation. I remember cuz I missed them and then he was mean. So I snuck back up the stairs and listened from the stairwell and overheard my parents and grandparents talking about how something wasn't right. It was like those stories, yada yada yada. I assumed they were talking about something random and got bored and went to play more PlayStation. A few weeks later, I asked about Uncle Danny and my dad said we're not gonna see them anymore. I was mad, and so I demanded to know why. He told me something about his dad being sick and so I was sad. Then I forgot about it, and life went on. Fast forward about five years. I'm at a supermarket where I used to live when all this happened. It was also where Danny and Lisa lived, only on the other side of the road. Being 10, I was never allowed to go over, but now that I can drive, I decide to go see the old house. Check out Danny and Lisa's house, I'm a nostalgic person, and see the only neighborhood. I'm driving slowly and rather creepishly down my old street when I spot Danny walking down the street. Excited as a duck I flag him down, pull over and get out to talk to him. He seemed stiff to me, kind of robotic I guess you could say. When he hugged me, but it was way too tight, and it felt like he was trying to smother me. I asked him how he'd been, and he said, alright. I asked him where Lisa was, and he said, at home. So I asked if I could see her, and he agreed. I walked with him, and asked him about all kinds of people and tried to catch up, but he didn't remember or didn't care about 90% of it, which seemed odd because Danny was always my awesome, involved Uncle Danny. Also, I'm on XE so I'm automatically paranoid and sheet. So I asked him a couple obvious trick questions, and he failed miserably, and now I'm a bit nervous. We get to his door and he opens it, and the smell of a goddamned meat locker pours out. A horrid, incomparable smell just assaults my nostrils. The place is a wreck. Sheet is just everywhere. Everything is coated in dust and sheet, and nothing looks clean. Laundry is everywhere. No lights are really on. It's a mess. 
I'm more than a little freaked out, and I asked what happened here, and he grunted. A really weird, almost guttural grunt. So I asked after Lisa, and she yelled from the kitchen, which was just behind a wall facing the room I was in. It wasn't a full wall, with the top not touching the ceiling, so I could smell and hear something cooking. I walked into the kitchen expecting to see Lisa making some normal food, and planning on asking Lisa why Danny was acting weird, but what I saw was unforgettable. She's standing in the kitchen, butt-ass naked, covered in blood, cooking some kind of mangled mess, surrounded by thousands of bones. I was just smart enough to notice a pile of mother-ducking collars in the corner. Though not until after I intentionally remembered this at home, ducking pet collars. I yelled and Danny lunged at me. I kind of stepped away from him clumsily and ran out the door. Danny gave chase and I got to the car and noped the duck as fast as my little blazer could go. I got home, called the police, gave them the address, and went straight to my dad. He punched me in the face and told me he overheard the address. I tried to apologize, and he yelled at me, so I yelled at him for lying to me, so he hit me again, then hugged me and said he was sorry. I tried to ask him, but he, rather strongly, told me to shut the duck up and forget about it. The police came to my house and told me they didn't find anyone living there, but that my story matched the description and the place was a ducking nightmare. They told me they suspected the previous owners left, and a mixture of wild animals and burglaring homeless people had been living there. My dad, being the ducking ridiculous genius he is, asked why the house hadn't been foreclosed, or bill payments hadn't been an issue. The cops stammered then said they'd look into it. Apparently Danny's father had still been paying for it all, as per some agreement when they got married. I still haven't seen them since, and my dad only once told me the story beforehand. My meeting up with them was pure coincidence, and only made the story worse. A couple years after all that happened, my dad told me this story, got drunk and in his drunken stupor that night told me he knew what would happen to Danny. He knew what they were. Better him than my dad. Used to go visit Grandpa up outside of Bozeman in the winters. Grandpa is this tiny little frail old man, but he's hardy as duck. He used to take us snowshoeing up in the mountains and carry most of the gear in this sled he pulled behind him. It was ducking cold up there. Your snot would be frozen before it left your nose. The times he did convince us to go out, we ended up staying in ice caves that Grandpa had carved into snowbanks earlier in the winter. It got dark really early. And of course, no campfires because ice and snow everywhere. One year we're out there camping with Grandpa, and he's really on edge the whole trip. Don't ask him why, because we are stupid kids and don't think it matters. Random outbursts, yelling at us for not tying a knot right, yelling at us for not keeping up with his insane pace. Stops hiking at about 2 water p.m. Nightfall isn't for another three and a half hours. Me and brother exchange WTF, looks with each other, look around for his ice cave, there isn't one. Hey, Grandpa, where are we camping? Grandpa is nowhere to be found, can't find his footprints, which is strange because snowshoes leave enormous footprints that you can't miss. Backtrack and re-follow the trail to where we were earlier, footprints just ducking end right where me and my brother were when Grandpa told us to stop for the day. After a lot of deliberation, we decide to head back, following our tracks back to the main road, where we will somehow flag down a car and get help to find our grandpa. We hike about an hour back the way we came. Where the hell have you kids been? It's grandpa and he's pissed. Says he was hiking along and all next time he turned around we weren't there. Says our footprints just ended about 100 paces back from wherever he was when he realized we were gone. We tell him something similar happened to us and we just got back from two miles ahead of us on the trail. Suddenly he goes into wild animal hyper-alert mode, stops talking, eyes scanning the forest around us, head pivoting side to side, trying to see everywhere at once. Get freaked out and brother starts crying, grandpa won't respond when we ask him what's wrong, quietly muttering incoherently to himself. After what seems like forever, grandpa starts moving again, simply says, Follow me. And we do, too scared to argue. But he's going in a third direction, i.e., not where we came from, and not where we were originally headed. We are all hiking close together, literally stepping on each other's feet. Can't hold hands because of ski poles, but we would have if we could have. Eventually, emerge in a clearing. 
I recognize it as a lake, but you'd never know it in the winter when everything is frozen solid. We get out on the ice and walk all the way to the middle of the lake before we stop. Grandpa tells us to get out our parkas, as we're going to be staying a while. Ask him what's happening. Doesn't answer. He gets out binoculars and starts to scan the shoreline. This is a pretty huge lake, so without binoculars, neither me or my brother could really see anything besides little distant trees on the shore. At this point, Grandpa puts the binoculars down, unpacks a fairly large caliber revolver and holster, and puts it on his hip. He then picks the binoculars up and points them in the same direction he was looking a minute ago. Me and my brother both look in that direction. I can barely see something moving around. No, a couple of things, all of various sizes. They're all hanging on the bank, though. None of them leave the thick brush surrounding the lake or venture onto the ice. After a few minutes, Grandpa silently hands me the binoculars. When I look at the movement on the shore, I almost sheet my pants. There are three animals. Two are what I can only assume are wolves, maybe coyotes, but I don't think so. The bodies are just too long, almost snake-like. The third animal is some sort of all-white thing standing on two legs. The more I look at it, the stranger it seems. At first, I took it to be a bear, just standing there on its hind legs. Then it starts walking, pacing around, really. And the legs are just too long and slender to be a bear's. I sit down on the ice, lean up against my backpack, and get a more steady grip on the binoculars. Slowly realize that whatever it is, has the approximate build of a human, but the head is clearly not a human head, some sort of animal. I can't place it. Ask Grandpa what the hell I'm looking at. Brother snatches Beanox away, and when he sees it, he labels it Bear Man and wants to take a few shots at it. Grandpa says Indians used to dress up in animal furs to blend in with the animals they were hunting. Slightly stop shedding myself, it's just an Indian in a bear skin, and he has two dogs that look like wolves, and they're following us but are afraid of ice. Start sheeting my pants all over again as I realize that this is about a hundred times weirder than a real bear man. It's starting to get dark, and we're still out there on the ice. We're all watching the Indian bear man, whatever the duck it is, and his dogs, wolves, slowly wandering along the coastline, clearly avoiding the ice, but clearly trying to get out onto it somehow. Every once in a while, they'll change direction, as though they were pacing back and forth. In the time I have the binoculars, I see the thing and his dog's wolves motionless and staring directly at us many times. No one breaks the silence for a long time. When it gets too dark to see anything on the shore, Grandpa relaxes, puts down the binoculars, and actually starts to make camp as though nothing had happened. Of course, we don't have a tent, but we do have sleeping bags and bivy bags to keep the blowing snow off of them and the wind off our faces. Me and my brother look at him like he's crazy. We're going to sleep out here. I say something like, what about that guy? Holy sheet, he's right over there. Doesn't matter. We spend the long night in that exact spot. Next morning, we can't locate any animals or bear men after 45 minutes of scanning the trees around the lake. Grandpa deems it safe enough to head back by now. And since he knows these woods so well, we take a different route back to the main road than we took to get there. After one mile, he's doubling back, staring at mountain tops and measuring angles between them with his arms, and I'm convinced he's lost. In the next moment, several things happen all at once. With no warning, a huge moose gallops out of seemingly thin air and almost crushes my brother, managing to push him on the ground. Grandpa collapses for an unknown reason. The three of us form a triangle, and in the middle is a slender person covered in all white fur, like a polar bear, and with a bear head, or maybe a mask, but it looked pretty damn lifelike. The two wolves, I'm sure they're wolves now, are circling at a distance, or rather one is circling. I don't see the other. Bearman lets loose a scream like you imagine Bigfoot might make when caught in a bear trap. Grandpa half sits up, points revolver, and fires off three shots at the thing in rapid succession. Huge puff of snow like a silent explosion, and can't see anything for a few seconds. Now a second moose goes hurtling through, and after it's gone and the snow has settled down, the bear man is gone too. 
no traces of blood to be found. Can still see the one wolf pretty far away, but it's still circling. We proceed to book it out of the woods, taking the shortest and most direct route off the mountain. Think that Grandpa isn't really sure about where he's going, but nobody gives a sheet. We have to keep moving. Still think I see the wolf out at the edge of my vision, several hundred feet out through the trees, or maybe it's both of them. We eventually do get back to Grandpa's car. Turns out he did know where he was going. It's been covered in fresh snowfall since we left it there. There are 10-inch paw prints all over it and around it. Nope. We clean off the snow and see that there are dents in the hood like hail fell on it, but they're right under where the paw prints were. Nope. Tear. Dodges. Dot biz. Dot nope. On the drive home, we all swear to never speak of this to grandma or to my mom. Have to swerve out of the way of a huge roadkill, almost drive off the road. Stop just in time. The thing in the road is a huge mound of fur with no distinct animal-like forms. No head, no legs, no tail. Blood everywhere. Looks like a giant skin thrown over a giant mound of flesh. It moves. Nope, 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 nope. Grandpa peels the duck out, drives home 30 mip over the speed limit, and we never look back. I was living in a house with some other dudes, basically nowhere. Outside of this city is just trees. It was a particularly harsh winter, but this night wasn't so bad. The power goes out. Are you afraid of the dark Nickelodeon? I look outside off my enclosed porch to see if I'm the only one, and the whole area is out. I forgot to mention that I'm a bit of a photography mag. That comes into play here. Well. There is nothing to do around here, and I think to myself that I never have seen such a mass power outage like this before. This might be a cool time to do a little bit of photography. I step out the door, feeling more anxious than usual. Just calm down, dude. Don't let this get the best of you. I continue on and take some cool photographs of car light trails. I also make a light penis, lol. But I can't shake the feeling that something has been following me. I'm getting really nervous, and it's too windy to listen around me. Let's call it a night, and I head back to the house. Just one more picture.xf. I take a pic of the house I live in, feeling really on edge, almost panicky. What the duck is going on? I never let myself get this bad. I really feel like I'm not the only one out here. Inside, taking off boots and snow gear next to the door, all of a sudden, something slams into the door. I sheet myself right there, lock the door, and get back to my room. I lock myself in there, calm down enough to sleep. The next day I go through my pics. Light penis, huh? I get to the pic of my house. Sheet, this picture is ducking creepy as hell. I can't believe my house looks like such a nightmare. Wait a second, the shadow doesn't look right. Look closer. Ducking got goosebumps writing this sheet. Sorry for the length. What the duck is that? I see what looks like some guy with a pig head staring right at me. I lose it. Ever since then, I've been hearing banging around my house like a couple of times a week at night. Whatever the duck that thing is, it wants in. I'm losing sleep over this. Pick related. It's the picture that I took. The duck is a skinwalker? Navajo myth, being of evil that can change shape by throwing a skin over himself. This is a story of a guy I met in the woods and a few friends of his. I can't guarantee anything as to its accuracy. I'm just going on what he told me to be true. A friend and a couple of buddies head out on the High Line Trail in Utah's Uintas Mountains for a week. They have enough cars in the group so as to be able to park one at each end of the trail. Everybody is excited to be out in the mountains together. Not long before, weird things start happening. It starts out with things like hiking poles and backpacks ending up at opposite sides of camp to where people left them. Everybody's boots are upside down in the morning. They hang their food bags on certain trees at night, but find them tied to certain other trees in the mornings. 
Most people brush this stuff off as animals or someone in their group getting a midnight snack. Weirder and weirder stuff starts happening. My friend wakes up to find muddy handprints all over the inside of his tent fly, in between the inner tent and the fly. As they're hiking, they lose the trail only to backtrack and find large, freshly cut branches and clever disguises laid over the actual trail. People are starting to think that they're being stalked. What really starts freaking people out is waking up to find their tents rearranged in their campsite. The stakes of the non-freestanding tents look like they're all undisturbed, but the tents are all in different places around camp. Nobody has any idea how their tents could have been all moved around and in some cases apparently broken down and re-pitched with none of them noticing or waking up. The next night, they decide to keep watch in three-hour shifts. Everyone is on edge. Watchmen get thick branches, tie knives to the ends, and arm themselves with bear mace. The first half of the night, nothing happens. Then it's my friend's turn to stand watch. He's got his camera because he figures the flash can illuminate wide areas if something comes close. It doesn't matter, though, because he falls asleep just before dawn, and nothing happens that night. The next morning, somebody asks him why he was taking pictures the last night. My friend freezes, slowly takes out his camera, checks the memory. There are pictures of everybody in the group sleeping, including himself. By following a creek a little ways upstream, they are able to find the trail, which someone recognizes as being not too far from their campsite. They only have 12 miles to go before they get to the trailhead, but it's early afternoon and they're doubtful they can finish their trip that same day. Reaching their campsite, they find all of their gear shredded in pieces. Apparently, only one backpack was unharmed. They find where their food had been hung scooped up as much as they could save from where it was scattered on the ground. Somebody luckily finds the car keys and they run the rest of the way back, getting lost several times but reaching the trailhead before dark. When they finally get to the trailhead, everyone is too exhausted to make camp or do any driving, so all six of them just pile into the car, lock the doors, and fall asleep. A knock on their window wakes them up early the next morning. It's the police, and the cop wants to know what these people are doing in a closed area. As they tried to explain the situation, the cop tells his own story. The entire entrance to the forest had been closed for days due to abnormal animal activity. My friend is getting suspicious why the police are handling the closure and not the forest rangers. He asks as much. The cop goes quiet and looks away. A very awkward moment, which is interrupted by one of my friend's hiking companions in the car. He notices that there are about a dozen other cars in the parking lot, but they all have flat tires. Everybody gets out of the car, and they realize that their own tires are flat. At this point, the cop comes clean and explains that there's actually a manhunt in the area, but they're not sure what exactly they're dealing with. Lots of dead hikers turned up earlier in the week. My friend remembers the strange photos and gets out his camera to show the cop. The cop's face suddenly goes blank, and he hands back the camera. It's a photo that was taken inside the car the night before, partially visible in the last photo, which is of my friend's sleeping face, like some kind of party photo where the taker holds the camera at arm's length to get himself in, is the right half of a pure white face with black holes for eyes and a mouthful of sharpened animal-like teeth. It was a skinwalker. Mother Ducker captures one of them when they go to take a piss, kills them, becomes them.